Researchers have just discovered something creepy and insidious about the acacia trees in the forests of Central America. Martin Hale is a lead professor of plant ecology at the Mexican Research Institute Sinvestiv Unidad Aeropuerto, and recently he led a team into the field, or more appropriately, into the forests, where they began observations of ant colonies of the species Pseudomyrmex ferruginius which form symbiotic relationships with the bullhorn acacia trees, or the acacia cornigera of Central America. The pseudomyrmex ants live in and on the acacia trees, using the horns of the plant as a place to grow their eggs. It might sound weird to say that a plant has horns, but the acacia trees have these horn-like protrusions. They're long and thin and pointy, and they're even bone-colored, and they bud out of nodes on the branches of the tree so as to discourage larger herbivores from eating them. These horns are hollow, which allows a queen ant to come within them and find shelter. The queen ant will then lay her eggs in the horn structure, and then she'll move to another horn and lay more eggs, and again and again and again over the course of several weeks, until eventually she's birthed a small army of drones. These ant drones are small, no larger than three millimeters or so, with wasp-like bodies and weirdly large eyes. Once this population of ants reaches a critical mass, around 400 to 500 individuals or so, they'll begin to patrol the tree and treat it like their territory. I mean, it is their territory. And they'll protect the tree from herbivorous animals of all sizes. They can kill bugs like caterpillars, crickets, termites, and all other kinds of smaller insects. And for larger creatures, like browsing mammals, they have a very painful sting that will deter them from eating the tree. The ants will even go so far as to hunt around the ground for seedlings of other trees that might be, uh, might be potential competitors for the host tree. These potential competitors cannot be tolerated, so the ants will commit the plant version of infanticide to get rid of them. The ants will enthusiastically defend the tree. And in return, the tree will nurse them with a sugar and amino acid-rich nectar that it secretes from the base of its leaves. This might seem like a nice little mutualistic symbiosis. Both parties benefit in that the ants are largely protecting the tree from annoying herbivores, and the tree is feeding them a tasty nutritious nectar. The acacia tree is so generous that it produces small, oily, protein-rich nodes on the ends of its leaves, and the ants can come and pick these nodes up and take them wherever they need to take them, and then eat them. All of these nutrients that the tree secretes are for the ant colony that protects it, and the ant colony really sounds like it deserves it. They put in a lot of work. So what could possibly be so creepy and insidious about this? Well, it turns out that there's more to the nectar than just sugar and amino acids. There's other compounds in there too, including two enzymes, called invertase and chitinase. Invertase is a catalytic enzyme that can be used to break down sugars, and so it's necessary for sugar digestion and metabolism. The ants actually have the genes to produce invertase, and in early life, they'll naturally produce it, they'll naturally express the enzyme. But Dr. Hale's research has recently discovered that at some point in early to mid-life, the ants lose this ability to produce invertase. The other enzyme that I mentioned is chitinase, and chitinase blocks the production of invertase. You can probably see where this is going. The acacia tree's nectar contains chitinase, which blocks invertase production in the ants. It shuts down the process of the gene being expressed as the invertase enzyme. And so now the ants lack this enzyme to break down sugar, which is bad. But the acacia tree also loads invertase into its nectar, which saves the ants, and once again allows them to break down sugars in their gut, in their little ant stomachs. This is where it gets really insidious, because Dr. Hale's uh, most recent research, the study that brought us this latest information, has found that the acacia trees are essentially making the ants chemically dependent on them. So even if the ants wanted to leave, they wouldn't be able to. They wouldn't be able to survive traveling away from their host tree. They need the invertase that the tree provides in its nectar, 
but they only need it because that same nectar also contains chitinase, which deprives the ants of their natural ability to produce invertase. There are some really dark, sinister undertones to this symbiosis, and it goes to show that these ecological relationships aren't exactly as simple as they might be portrayed in a textbook. You might read that a mutualist symbiosis is defined as one that's beneficial for both parties, and this technically qualifies as a mutualist symbiosis. But clearly, there's a darker, more coercive element involved. But if you feel bad for the ants, don't worry about them, because they're not as enthusiastic as it might seem at first. Scale insects are able to slip through the ants' defense network because the scale insects secrete a sugary honeydew that the ants can also eat. Because the scale insects provide this delicious ecological service to the ants, the ants don't want to get rid of them. They actually want to protect the scale insects, and so they, they protect them much like they protect the acacia tree. From a certain perspective, this is like a cheap shot against the acacia tree, because the scale insects are known to drink the tree's sap and in the course of doing so, they become a common vector for disease. It's really interesting that these ecological relationships are more complicated and more nuanced than they seem at first glance. It reminds me of the other ecological relationships, where there seems to be some kind of... Uh, it's hard to ascribe it to malice, but there's definitely preferential treatment. I'm thinking of, like, fungus that form symbiotic relationships with, with plants. The plants will feed the fungus sugars that they produce from photosynthesis, while the fungus will provide the plants with water and nutrients that they're structurally better able to extract from the soil. This is a nice mutualistic symbiosis, but researchers have observed fungus hoarding nutrients from the tree and taking an unfair amount of carbohydrates from the plant. And in the larger habitat size networks that exist between different fungus and all sorts of different trees, there's this big network of nutrient exchange, except the trees can exchange nutrients preferentially with each other. They can choose to give nutrients more to their offspring and genetic kin while denying some of these nutrients to a competing species or a competing population, even though they're all connected through the same nutrient exchange corridors that exist in the form of the fungal networks that permeate the soil. It's all really complicated and really nuanced and incredibly interesting. And I love studies like this because they give us an insight into the macroscopic interactions of all of these biochemical superstructures that covered the surface of the Earth. And that insight is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm.